Hello everyone, it's me Bryson P. Energy is quite a complex problem that we have across the entire world. Each country deals with it a little bit differently, and the United States is no exception. Since I'm having a conversation like this in my comments on a, another video, I figured this would be a great way to continue the conversation. So how has Norway built a EV vehicle utopia while here in the United States we are lacking severely behind? This video by CNBC, it's a quite a long documentary, so this will be a multi-part series, but we're going to see why they believe we are struggling so much to go electric. Norway, the land of the midnight sun, is filled with mountains, glaciers, fjords, and electric vehicles, a lot of them. The Scandinavian country boasts the highest EV adoption rate in the world. More than 82% of new car sales were electric vehicles last year. And that number goes up to over 90% if you include plug-in hybrids. Our goal is that all new cars by 2025 will be zero emission vehicles. We think we're gonna reach that goal. In the US, a measly 7.6% of new car sales were electric in 2023, up from 5.9% in 2022. In the world's largest auto market, China, 24% of new car sales were EVs in 2023. Norway's capital Oslo is also electrifying its ferries, buses, semi-trucks, and even construction equipment. All public transportation within the end of this year will be zero emission in the city. Gas pumps and parking meters are being replaced by chargers. It's an electric utopia of Whoa. the future. Parking meters are being replaced by zero emission in the city. That? Gas pumps and parking meters are being replaced by chargers. It's an electric utopia of the future and even construction equipment. All public transportation uh, within the on. end of this year will be zero emission in the city. Gas pumps and parking meters are being replaced by chargers. It's an That, what in the world vehicle is that? I've never in my life seen that vehicle right there. I don't even know what to make of that. What in the world is that? It looks cool, but at the same time, I don't know, that's so crazy looking to me. Electric utopia of the future. What is this? Welcome to my man cave. So how has Norway's grid been able to handle all those EVs? A lot of hydropower. Electric cars is maybe a third of the price of gasoline because we have close to 100% hydropower. It's cheap, it's available and renewable. So that's a big advantage. The rapid expansion certainly hasn't been perfect. There are some side effects that we have learned to observe. We are pushing cars basically on the public. So there's been an increase in the total amount of cars bought. We want the change, but maybe not at this pace of this volume. So how did Norway pull off such a high EV adoption rate? And what can the US learn from the country? We flew across the globe to meet with experts, government officials, and locals to find out. We flew into Oslo Airport and picked up our electric rental car. I'm here picking up my rental car and I've never seen so many electric cars in a rental hub before. iX3. My first time driving an EV. Let's see how this goes. The first thing that was noticeable as we were driving was the lack of tailpipes on the cars on the road. Tesla is the most popular brand on the roads in Norway, with a 20% market share in 2023. We saw them everywhere. The Tesla Model Y was the most sold car in the country last year, followed by the Volkswagen ID4 and the Skoda Enyaq. All zero emission electric cars, they have license plates that start now, I will say I agree. I saw I, I saw more Teslas and more electric vehicles whenever I visited Oslo than I have anywhere else. I've never driven a electric vehicle, <clears throat> at least not yet, but I have ridden in a couple Teslas. I was able to ride in a Tesla while I was there in Oslo, um, while I was doing some sightseeing and getting to meet with some people. And recently, a few months ago, I got to ride in a, a model uh, Plaid. Whichever one is the highest, highest of the highest level. And it was at the Nashville International Speedway. 
that was quite an experience getting to fill the launch control on that. Starts with E, so it's always easy to spot them. California has the highest EV adoption rate in the U.S. 21.5% of new car sales were electric in 2023, a figure that has doubled in the past two years. But Norway made California look like it was in the dark ages. <clears throat> there are chargers everywhere. The streets are quiet in Oslo. The air is pleasantly free of fumes. There's been a noticeable improvement to the air quality in the city? Yeah, it is. Uh, so around 20% reduction of local pollution. It was actually noticeable when a gas-powered car sputtered by. We did find a few people who still drove gas-powered cars. Some couldn't afford to buy a new car, and others still couldn't get past range anxiety for long trips, despite the abundance of chargers. I need to have a Land Rover because I'm going to the mountain. Uh, that's uh, a little bit too long for the electric car, because I also have electric car for use in city, but um, not for mountain. <laughs> but most people we spoke with were on their Just out of curiosity, you have an electric car for, I'm just being devil's advocate here, but if you have a electric car for the city, then why are you driving your Range Rover around in the city? That kind of defeats the purpose of having an electric car for the city. Because I don't, I don't necessarily, I mean, unless you're going to the mountains at that particular time, but I don't know. Like I said, just playing devil's advocate here. Second or even third EV already. I've been driving an electric car since 2012. We just got a new uh, one, it's a Tesla, and I'm uh, very, very happy with it. We have two electric cars at home. Anything you miss about driving a gas-powered car? No, no, actually, no, because it was so expensive. Uh, yeah, I, when I see the gas prices, I'm like, God damn, it's so expensive these days. So no, I, no, no actually, I, I'm not looking back. Why is Norway so far <laughs> ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to electric vehicle adoption? There is a combination of a lot of different policy measures that has taken place over the last 20 years. We started off actually in 1990, first measure. We had the Olympic Games in Norway in 1994. So some of the producer measure. We had the Olympic Games in, oh, started on. off actually in. Is, it's, who are these people right here? Are they of any importance? I feel like they are for some reason. And I feel like I've seen these people before, but I don't want to be completely wrong and they're just random people that happen to be in the camera at this point. 1990 first measure. We had the Olympic Games in Norway in 1994. So some of the producers wanted to introduce electric vehicle cars by then. There was this car called Think, which was really, really small and it was made basically a joke back in the day because no one really wanted it. Think never actually took off and the company was eventually sold to Ford. The whole parliament agreed on that there is some kind of public responsibility to push forward the green mobility. And we set a goal for 2025 that all new passenger cars should be zero emission. And when you have set a goal like that, you have to put some incentives to make it work. We started off by having a zero registration tax. And then the biggest measure that we introduced was a zero uh, value added tax. So in Norway, there's a 25% value added tax for every item you purchase. But reducing that to zero for uh, the EVs had a massive impact. But despite of all these measures, nothing really happened. Nothing happened because EVs were not readily available then. But it all started to change when Tesla and others started selling EVs in the country. So we've seen a vast increase in the last. So here's a good question that I have, especially because Norway has such a large volume of electric vehicles. I see whenever there's videos posted or comments of different things, whenever a electric vehicle here in the United States, one of our northern states or somewhere where it gets really cold, and it snows, and then all of a sudden the range or the capabilities of the electric vehicle goes tremendously down. And then, of course, you see all the people all talking about, you know, well, that's how it is. The batteries are horrible. There's low life expectancy on them in severe cold temperatures, this, that, and the other. So with Norway being so much colder and further north than I am, how do, how do they really... How do they really interact during the really cold times that you experience? 
or especially in the mountainous or the snow or any of those areas where you really have that severe temperature does it does it change the range that the battery is capable of that much especially say whenever you're running the heat in order to maintain warmth right i would assume that because you're having to produce a lot more energy then it's going to use a lot more energy because of the temperature difference that would be my basic understanding which is why i'm asking Ten years. So now, eight out of ten new cars are zero emission vehicles. So the remaining twenty percent is plug-in hybrid and some few petrol cars as well. So if you want to buy a new car in Norway, there's very high taxes on polluting cars. But for zero emission cars, they are exempt. So that made EVs cheaper or at the same price as a, as a similar petrol or diesel car. And we also have discount if you drive through the toll roads with an EV. Free parking in some cities and also driving in the bus lanes is also a very popular incentive for EVs. Peter Hognaland is the Assistant Secretary General of the Norwegian EV Association, which launched back in 1995 to support consumers. Now, will a lot of these incentives disappear, say, whenever you get to that year where a lot of these incentives are based that you know, we want to become fully electrified by this time or we want to make it to where there's no um, emissions producing vehicles by this year. So once you get to that certain point and then there's almost no emissions vehicles on the road, will that become where, say, getting to drive in certain lanes or getting to do certain things such as free parking because you have an electric vehicle? Is that going to stay or is that just going to eventually go away and it'll be back to where because now everyone's an electric vehicle pretty much. So there's no reason to have these special incentives because it's free to park here just because you have an electric vehicle. But everybody's got an electric vehicle by this point. You know, I'm just curious, 10 years from now, how does that work? Consumers in the transition. We have over 50 employees now, have a call center for EV owners, especially the new ones. They need help how to do this. How do the subsidies work? When you go to purchase a car, is there a lot of paperwork or is it just a cheaper price when you purchase a car? You don't have to do anything. You just pay the price, so it's really easy. The electrical car will be cheaper to purchase. It's cheaper to use, so the electrical bill is uh, smaller than the bill for diesel and petrol. So this has to be the main goal, to make it easy to choose and cheaper to choose. Have there been any negative consequences to this plan so far? Maybe something unexpected that has come up? I think. And again, so we make it, and this is just, I'm trying to understand a little bit better here, but so we we're making these incentives to where it's such a non-brainer choice to buy an electric vehicle over a petrol powered vehicle. But then once it gets to a certain point, there's a tipping point where it's no longer all those benefits are, you know, what, how do you still have all these benefits and, and, you know, convince people that it's better to buy an electric vehicle whenever you get to a certain point that that's all that there is anyways. So you're no longer having to convince them to buy an electric vehicle because there's no other incentive out there because that's just the way that that's you either have an electric vehicle or you don't. Or would there always be an option for there to be a petrol powered vehicle somehow? And I don't think that's the route that you all are trying to go either. This is um, a great success. We have changed the preferences for the public and for the user and also from the market. So I've been asked this question before, but I can't think of anything. But Shearstad did mention that on top of more cars being on the road than ever before, Another consequence has been more people are now choosing to drive their EVs instead of taking public transportation. People rather choose to go by car into the city than by bus. So there has been some local adjustments when it comes to the price of traveling by public transport, making it cheaper so it can compete with the zero emission vehicles. Where's the money coming from? This is public spending. Some, uh, so it's both from the state budget. What's the annual expense for the government for oh. these incentives? Uh, it's less and less, but I think it's about 40 billion NOC uh, yearly. 
So far, they've spent about $20 billion, and we're still spending about $4 billion a year. So that's $1,000 per inhabitant, or $800 per inhabitant, in terms of subsidizing electric car purchases, which is quite a lot. You get uh, an S-Class uh, for the same price as you get a medium-sized sort of economy car that uh, runs with an internal combustion engine. Norway is a wealthy country, and much of that wealth has come from its robust oil and gas industry. Norway is Western Europe's largest oil and gas exporter, and the industry is expected to make up 24% of the nation's GDP in 2024. The gas export has increased over the last years due to the war in Ukraine, and it's very important for Norway to be a stable energy partner with our neighboring countries in Europe that suddenly experience a drop in the supply from Russia. But Norway also, we have our goal, 55% reduction of emissions in 2030 compared to 1990. That's the same goal as total in the European Union. Well, that's something the oil industry also knows. So they are planning on what next, what's the new type of energy they will produce. So we have now a, a massive plan for wind production on the Norwegian continental shelf. So we're all working with this transition year by year with the same goal in uh, 2030. We have a lot of discussion about the oil industry in Norway. The Norwegian government has said that we would go for electric cars anyway. The discussions are decoupled and we see now with almost a quarter of all cars in Norway are fully electric now. Also the, the demand for petrol and diesel is going down. That might be also a wake-up call for the global oil industry that maybe the future is not bright for them. <laughs> Norway took its oil wealth and it, it just... Okay, so we're stopping it here for this video. I hope that you'll join me on part two as I continue to learn about how Norway has built a utopia using EV vehicles and why the U.S. has struggled to go electric. We hadn't really got to why the U.S. has struggled so much, so I assume that that's going to be further in this documentary video. I'll see you in the next one. It's me, Bryson P. Have a great day, great night, whatever time it is that you see this. Goodbye.